Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking. For the past week or so, I've been giving my Patreon members kind of a sneak previews of segments of a larger build video that I'm doing. I'm kind of, it's the first time I've ever done this uh, project plan, then you sell plans kind of concept where you, you have a nicely polished 15, 20 minute video on building something. Uh, it shows 90, 95% of the public out there exactly what they want to see what you made and how you made it but those you know five percent that actually want to build the project they generally like to buy some plans and get a little bit more information so content creators will sell plans and then give you access to six eight a dozen more in-depth videos that are kind of run and gun maybe the polish isn't as well but the density is there the knowledge is there so that's what I'm going to be trying out and we're going to be doing it the worth the effort way. And what that means is, as always, I focus more on the long-term educational because, hey, I know I think wrong and a lot of uh, shop appliance builds and stuff like that, I think are wasted opportunities because nobody I know gets into the romantic nature of uh, woodworking, furniture making and stuff like that with the idea that the kitchen cabinet is the best piece of furniture you can build. And yet a lot of us shop appliances that we build are kind of those kitchen cabinet grade, screwed, glued together, that kind of stuff. Me personally, when I got into it, I saw those nice chairs, tables, Maloof stuff and that kind of stuff. And if all you're doing is stapling and riveting your shop furniture together, which is, I understand, it is a perfectly fine method of making stuff. And with people with a lot of experience, they just want to get it built. But most of my audience is new woodworkers. And with a little bit more time, they could actually experiment and learn the type of joinery and stuff like that that they might want to use out there. Shop equipment is a great chance to mess up, to screw up. And really, the consequences aren't that big a deal because you're using cheap materials. You're just kind of blasting your way through it, learning the techniques so that you will have confidence when your money's on your line, when you've got the expensive materials, when the client is playing something, or you know that you're making the perfect gift. And in my mind, spending a little bit extra time with shop equipment, which doesn't matter, is the best way to learn. And that's what I go for in pretty much everything I do. And that's what's going to set my projects apart. Because a project is just a medium for the education. <laughs> so, uh, some of my patrons mentioned to me that this one particular segment that I'm about to show you is a good illustration of the depth that I'm going and the educational aspect. So I thought, hey, maybe it'd be a good teaser for y'all. Plus, it's a kind of a standalone lesson uh, on dimensioning. And you've got to trust me. This lesson is a beginner level lesson. It's where us beginners and amateurs should really be thinking through how we dimension of stuff. The experts I talk about, uh, talk to and admire so much, they take this kind of in-depth thought to the nth level, just so far beyond me in getting the perfect material for their projects. Me, I'm just worrying about the grain. So enjoy this segment as a kind of a free teaser of what a lot of people will be paying for in the future. Enjoy and have fun. When I am building my own shop equipment, shop furniture, that kind of stuff, I like using construction lumber over stuff like, uh, you know, plywood, MDF, that kind of stuff. Mainly because, again, I like to use my shop equipment as a chance to learn. And construction lumber is some of the most cantankerous stuff we have available. Now, in my part of the country, the larger uh, pieces, 2x10s, 2x8s, 2x12s, 2x16s, they're all going to be southern yellow pine. In the smaller sizes, or even the smaller, bigger ones, it could be, you know, just about any softwood. But it's pretty much some kind of loblolly southern yellow pine around here. And from my understanding, when you get into the bigger boards, that's pretty common in most areas of the United States. I, I can't say for the utmost northern area, but a lot of the big box stores truck in the bigger stuff because it's, it's inexpensive for them. 
but this stuff really is cantankerous. I mean, it will, it's actually some of the most stable wood there is, this highly resinous stuff, when it is fully dried, because those resins are like polymers, plastic, and they harden up when they get really aged. But until that point, when you get them from the store, when they are pretty much green wood, this stuff will twist, warp, all that kind of stuff if you don't take grain direction into consideration and actually working with it. It demands the sharpest of tools. This stuff will crumble underneath the dull chisel. If you're planing it and planing it in the wrong direction, it will tell you. If you're planning it with a dull tool, it will tell you. It informs you of the mistakes you are making and demands that you get better. It's a great learning material so that when you get to the, the stuff you are making for family members or stuff you want to sell where quality is dependent upon how much money you're going to make and food you're going to put on the table, well, when you get into those situations, you will have dealt with the worst of the worst so you can overcome a lot of the other stuff. In fact, woodworking will come, somewhat become second nature in your relationship to grain direction because you just get used to using it. And if you make a mistake, who really cares? The stuff is cheap. How cheap is it? Well, just for fun, let's do the math. Now, in my area, I tend to buy 2x10s or 2x12s. I try to get a 2x12 because the wider the board is, the bigger the tree was, probably the branches were higher, so you're going to get clearer, straighter grain that's going to have less reaction wood that's going to be fun, finicky whenever you're using your your tools. Unfortunately, a 2x12 by 12 in my area is about 20 bucks. Now for some reason a 2x10, which is only it's less than two inches shorter, they're about 12 bucks right now. So price-wise the 2x10s are more economical. Now, me personally, anything below 2x10, you're not going to get that big a yield off of the good stuff when you consider how much of the board you're actually using because it is so cheap. So let's do the math on that 2x12. Well, 2x12s are really an inch and a half thick. When they sell it 2 inches to you, that, that's 2 inches from the bandsaw mill, meaning the tree falls over, then they cut that in 2 inches. That doesn't count any machining that happens to it. So when they run it through a thickness planer to make it consistent and somewhat smooth, that removes a little bit, that comes off of the two inches. When the tree dries a little bit more and shrinks a little bit, that comes out of that two inches. So you end up with roughly an inch and a half. And a two by 12, they're generally only going to be about 11 inches. I think it's like 11 and a quarter, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. But 11 inches is close enough. And then it is 12 feet long, so that would be 12 by 12, 144? Yeah, 144. One board feet, I could have figured that out. So, our grand total is 2,376 square inches. We divide that by 144, which I guess I shouldn't have done that one there but we get our 16.5 board feet of material 16.5 board feet for 20 bucks that's what a little over a dollar a board foot you can't buy any hardwood for that kind of price range even off of craigslist i mean we're talking this is dirt cheap stuff so if we waste a little bit of it and we double our board feet price, it's still cheap. So why not take some risk, experiment with the construction lumber? And dealing with this means you've got to start with the boards you pick out from the store. Yes, you've got to be one of those people that's going to go through the stack looking for the best stuff. And what do I mean by best stuff? Well, you can find 2 by 12 by 16 that are perfectly clean in a stack. And generally when I go to the, a big box store, I will go buy the, 
wood section and if I see a clean board on the top or in a row down I'll snag it and you end up kind of collecting these things because they aren't that much money to begin with and you need to let them dry that's a key thing is after you pick out good wood let it sit around your shop for a month or six months or something like that if it's six months in your shop laying down flat that stuff is going to be really dry and great to work with this stuff right here has been sitting around for about two months but the other thing is where from the tree did the board come from in my mind these two boards right here are prime project wood yes it has a crack in fact if you go all the way down this board is pretty much surface cracked all the way down right down the middle but what i like about it is a this particular board didn't have a single knot in the entire thing all the way down and this was actually a 16 foot board which i cut four feet off the end uh, but i also noticed that this one right here is somewhat flat sawn the center of the tree was probably down here somewhere that gave me a bunch of bastard grain material see how the grain is coming from side to side on this one right here that is great chair material then the center section right here has a bunch of cracks in it so probably from about right here down it's just going to be trash for me but i have been known to use that in panels for shop equipment where the crack doesn't really matter and it's just kind of blocking space this board right here i thought was great because look at where the grains are right here the pith of the tree was literally right there which meant all of this wood was straight straight and if i look down it is completely straight all the way down this is a fairly wide straight grain board that has both quarter sawn wood and bastard bastard sawn bastard or rift sawn right there great board this will be future trash but also look at them this way too you see these cathedrals this one the cathedrals are all pointing this way pretty much and this darker area right here well that was the center of the tree and you see all these little knots on right on outside the tree well, as pine trees grow, the knots on the lower section typically fall off and you get these things up here. But as they get taller and taller and taller, those branches are higher up, which means that this side stuff is generally really, really clear on really tall, big trees. And because there were no real knots anywhere around them, they don't have reaction wood, so the grain's not going to reverse on you. But notice this heartwood kind of tapers out. So this particular board was not sawn straight at the pith. Uh, it kind of tapered to one end. So I had to watch this right here on this type of board to make sure that the grain runs very straight on the side. And I'll just try to follow one grain line all the way down. And if I can get that one, I can rest assured that it's not going to want to warp or twist on me too much after I cut away all of this stuff. Whereas this board right here, it might be super, super clean, which is why I got it. But notice the cathedrals, they start here, but they're reversing right here. And then they reverse again over here. So this board right here was cut fairly parallel because the grain's kind of doing this action right there. So my opinion is this board right here will probably turn out my best board because... It was sawn parallel with the pith. Now, if you don't want to take into a lot of that consideration and stuff like that, you can buy perfectly dry, perfectly sawn southern yellow pine or other softwoods from a hardwood dealer. They generally call it vertical grain, and it will be the premium stuff. Look at that grain, how straight it is. But also look. See how you're getting cathedrals on the side? This is 100% quarter sawn, which in my opinion means it won't make good material for things like legs. This makes great material for rails and styles and table tops and stuff like that, where having that perfectly straight grain from top to bottom just kind of makes it very uniform. 
plus the fact that this has been kiln dried properly to a furniture grade dryness. This stuff right here is probably still 12 to 20 percent moisture content and I would not leave it on anything metal for long because it will rust it. There's so much moisture evaporating out of it. That's why you want to leave it in your shops till it gets to the point where it's not so cool, meaning less water is evaporating out of it and it's cooling itself. The downside to buying vertical grain from hardwood dealers though is this one piece right here ran me $24. This piece right here, a 2x10, ran me 12 And I will probably get a lot more useful material out of this than that. Now this vertical grain board I just brought out to show you I will be, I'm saving this for a specific tabletop I want to do, but, but I do have available to me these two 12 foot boards, this 7 foot board, which is an off cut of this one right here, uh, because it was a 20 foot long board, uh, I just cut that off to fit it in my truck, and that 2 by 12 right there, plus hanging them up. Now, you do the math. This 12 footer was $12. It's a 2 by 10. This 20 footer I believe was $16. So now we're looking at $28. That big 12, uh, that 2 by 12 was 20 bucks. So that's 48 bucks. And then I did buy that sheet of plywood for uh, $30. So that's $70 and $10 for the whiteboard. So I'm going to be into this entire project for about 80 bucks, not counting the hardware. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be using all of these, but I do have it available to me, and I have no problem wasting a little bit of it to get the best pieces out of it to learn on. I mean, it's cheap education. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is start milling it, milling up the different parts, and I like to start with the thickest piece of material I'm going to need, which is on this particular project is going to be the legs, which is going to require a glue up, which means I need to pick each individual legs out of the boards ahead of time and place them in order that I'm going to glue them up in order to make the grain disparity between two boards disappear as much as possible. So let's, so let's examine what I'm looking for. So when I'm at the store picking out my material, I tend to like to get stuff that's going to be around the center of the tree. And if you're getting your 2x10s and 2x12s, that's generally where it's going to come because those are the widest parts of the tree. Very rarely are you going to get a very large board from this part of the tree that's going to be pretty much completely flat on. Plus the fact that board would pretty much warp instantly. These boards if you take them directly from the tree or slightly off, they will warp, but what happens is they tend to warp around the pith. These outside wings will be fairly straight, so if you were to cut out the pith, you're going to get pretty flat boards on either side of it. And that, from that center section, would mean that you're pretty much getting quarter sawn boards. Now, it's nice if you can get at least one board that's somewhat up here, where it's going to have what they call bastard or rift sawn right there and then flat sawn in the middle because that's where you're going to get your chairs and your panels. The cathedrals do might like make nice panels if you orient them the right way but chair legs pretty much demand rift sawn material. Here's why. If I were to take a chair leg out of the board right here a blank I'm going to use for it. Well, let's look at the grain. That is pretty much a quarter sawn blank. What that means is when you're looking at this side and this side, you're going to see all those straight lines. Very homogeneous very nice looking. But on this side, and this side, what do you think you're going to be seeing? You're going to see extreme cathedrals. You know, things that look like this. 
And when you put that next to a board that looks like this, you know, as you move around that table, that's going to draw your attention. That's going to look out of place. So what we really want to do is find a piece of the tree that's kind of at a diagonal. That way, if you look at the grain, every single side is going to have these straight lines coming off of it. You won't get any cathedrals like that. So as you move around it, it will look consistent. It will look right. And there's another advantage that a lot of people don't talk of nowadays because so many people use kiln-dried lumber. This stuff Technically, it's killed and dried, but it's still green, it's still wet, and it's still drying. And this was an advantage they took, it, took, of, took back when they made furniture from green lumber. You see, as wood dries, the distance between the growth rings kind of shrinks a little bit, and that causes the growth rings to want to straighten out. So this particular block of wood is actually going to shrink in this way, and that way, as these distances close up, so you end up with somewhat of a diamond shape. Let's see if I can draw that right. And what's cool about that is if you've already assembled your table or chair or something like that with mortise and tenon joinery, Well, there's going to be a little gap that develops right here and right there, but this outside is actually going to get even tighter. And if you get it tight on the outside of it, your chair or table becomes much more stable over time because the woods kind of shrink down on it and close any gaps and actually bite in. It's a great phenomenon that you can take advantage of. But it only happens if you use riffs on for chair legs. Now in my head the legs are always the most important part of the piece and that's why I do them first. They also typically require the most wood because they are the thickest part of the piece. Now these are about an inch and a half thick and my design calls for legs that are under three inches but more than about two and a half and I won't know what they'll fully be until I mill them all up. But in order to get blanks that are, you know, three inches square, I'm going to have to glue these things up. And in order, in order to make it look like they weren't glued up, what I want to do is find sections of the board that they are clear for about six feet. That way I can cut that in half, bring one on top of the other, and the grain will pretty much be identical, all going in the same direction. That way the glue line is going to somewhat disappear whenever I mill things together because it is from the same board, same thickness, same color, that kind of stuff. And if I can get all four out of one board, the color will be a perfect match. So here's a quick montage. Me milling up this board right here, attempting to get four leg, enough material for four legs out of it and two legs out of this one. I think I can get one that's going to be pretty pristine, color match, grain match, and stuff like that. And then one that's going to be out of some trash material that's just going to be a practice one. That extra one will be in case I screw one up here. So I'll have six legs, one practice, one backup.
So I hope you can see now what we were going for. The grain is consistency, bastard grain. So it's going to be fairly straight grained on all four corners. We just really need to focus on keeping light boards together, which is why I've labeled them that side. But you also notice I put pencil line right here because I'm about to glue these up. So there's no sense in me dimensioning all these perfectly square. All I need to worry about right now is getting these two faces flat so that the glue will glow up there. And then I'll dimension them after the glue up. Now, when going through that, two of the boards I cut out of the center, well, they weren't cracked. So these are pretty good. And if I wanted to use these to make something like a rail or style, where nobody's going to be seeing this top section because it'll be inside, but the show side, well, guess what those are? Perfectly quarter sawn. That'd be a nice show face that would match up very well with this style of leg. So I'll just hold on to these for a while. So I've now got these eight boards glued up so that the faces are kind of tight and you can tell they're a good match when you try to move them. They don't kind of pivot one area. Now if you're having a bit of a problem getting them to match perfectly so that they don't have some slack, a trick would be to take something like your block plane and put a really fine shaving right down the middle. That way, you know that you'll be getting contact on both sides and the glue will kind of suck the middle together a little bit. Just a very, very fine shaving on both boards and then bring them back together and it should work out just fine. I'm going to go ahead and glue all these up and then move on to the next step and let these dry overnight. Now, my next step is going to be four squaring these up. I'm going to get all four legs blank perfectly the same size and perfectly squared at 90 degrees. And I'm going to do that one all the way through the leg for the simple reason I have the machinery. But if you don't have all this machinery I have to do the four steps, you don't really need to. I think that is kind of a misconception a lot of us have gotten into because we've grown up for the past generations or so with people that use machineries like these to make it perfect. But look at what we actually need to get accurate. Here's the rough sketch of my plans and this is kind of how I generally work. I don't really work off of detailed plans off, well I don't think I ever have. I just get general ideas so I can do my basic measurements. And I don't stick to these measurements because I do a lot of relative building. And as such, I don't have to have my legs to be perfectly dimensioned. In fact, they don't have to be square or straight at all. All I really need to get perfect is the distance from the top down to whatever last stretcher I have. That one on this side and that side has to be 90 degrees. This outside corner, it just has to look good. So you could easily do just a portion of a leg and get it accurate based off of maybe your tri-square or a combination square. And the rest of it, just make it pretty. 
which to me in a modern day small shop is if I had a bandsaw I could easily get it really close to 90 degrees and just plane away the bandsaw marks and be ready to put this thing together. Now my opinion has always been if you are starting out in woodworking you want to get into you know kind of joinery furniture making you know get a good hand hand tool background so that you can accomplish just about anything with a small set of tools and get a bandsaw. A bandsaw will make your life so much easier in a hand tool shop and in fact it works very much like a hand tool except it saves you a lot of the grunt work, the labor. You don't get a figure like me ripping up long 12 foot long boards. That's what the bandsaw is for. And with that bandsaw, you can set the blade up to pretty much 90 degrees and then all you have to do is get rid of the bandsaw marks with your hand tools and fine tune it. Works really, really well, just not quite as fast as a traditional power tool shop. You know, there's a reason why people like me who've been in it for a while will slowly collect a thickness planer, a jointer, and then maybe a table saw. Because with those tools, I can make this entire leg exactly the same dimension without much effort. But I need to reiterate, you don't have to have these tools to accomplish projects like this. You know, a little hand tool, square up one corner, and the rest just make cosmetic. Now my methodology of four squaring something like a table leg or even a board is very traditional. You start out at the jointer to create one straight edge and if you need to create a parallel 90 degree edge and then you either use a table saw on something like a square thing to make parallel sides on the two other sides or if you're doing a board you square up one the width of it on the table saw and the thickness on the thickness planer. Those three tools are kind of the workhorses of rough dimensioning stuff that took pretty much perfection over its entire length. But once again, it's not necessary. But before you start dimensioning four square, you have to do some consideration. Remember, it always comes down to the grain. Typically on a tree, the farther out, the older the tree gets, the newer growth ranks are going to be closer and closer, closer together. So once you can get past in hardwoods, the sapwood, you know, it's best to use the outside corner of the tree as you're starting to mention if you know you're going to be removing quite a bit of the material. Plus, it'll be the more tighter the rings, the more it's going to want to move. So I know I've got roughly three inches here, and I'm only going to have legs that are between two and two and a half inches, uh, depending on what I think that looks like. So I'm going to be removing quite a bit. So I might as well square up these corners right here and then remove this material right there to get the most stable wards with the tightest grain on all four sides. Plus the fact that when I orient it, I want the outside of the tree to be going to the outside of the table. That way as things can... Uh, as things shrink and it compresses, as we discussed earlier, these will be where it tightens up the most. So, even before I start dimensioning, I'm still thinking about the grain. Okay, so here are my four legs. Uh, I came down to about two and a half inches on each one square, and I had the glue joint on top of all of them. So you should be able from, you know, a foot and a half to the camera to tell where the glue joint is, right? Pretty consistent all the way around. Now one thing 
is all of these are three feet long. As we said, I took them out of six foot sections and cut those in half. But my in my initial designs, I only need legs that are about 27 inches. The reason why I have the excess is because the machineries I use, the thickness planer especially, has some snipe to it. And you will notice that on some of the ends, let me see if I can zoom in. There's some gappage. And I will leave these long for the entire build until the very last thing. One of the last things I do is cut the top and the ends. So that allows me a good six to 10 inches to kind of pick where on these will be the best portion of it in case something like that snipe comes in there. So leave them long. But the last step that I do on leg builds like this is pretty much every project I break the edge with this slight round over. It's just a small one. So if I go to the outside on the grain ring and I know that this is going to end up being the show face, I will go ahead and break that edge now. It allows me to find that side by feel anytime I want and I know it's not going to get, going to get excess d damage during the build process. So the last thing I do is go ahead and break this edge. Now I know I babbled a lot in this but dimensioning is one of those things that really does separate the people that are doing really well in the craft and those are just kind of getting along. Because how many of y'all out there have picked up a board and looked for the best face? Well, in this situation, we made the best face. From actually going picking the boards correctly from the lumber yard and how we process it, we got the best results we can. It wasn't just happen chance. We worked for that. And that's part of what dimensioning stock is, is going thinking it all the way through. A lot of what I talk about is common sense once you hear it one time. And I hope this is the chance that you got to at least start hearing what people well above my skill level go through when they're designing stuff. From the lumber yard to applying finish. It's all about grain direction. So, the last question is, when do you dimension stuff? Me, personally... I kind of dimension at the last minute. Uh, if I'm doing, you know, like legs, I'll do all the legs. The next step is to make, uh, start building up the structure of the of the router table, which means basically the rails and styles. So I'll then dimension those because those are pretty much going to be all the same thicknesses, though they'll be a different uh, height, uh, depending upon if it's the upper or lower. And I'll do all those at once. I'll do all the joinery on those at once. And then when I come to make, maybe making the drawers, I'll dimension up all the drawer parts at that time. If I was doing something bigger than shop equipment where I'm just doing it for the experience, I was making money on it, I might dimension all this hardware, set it aside for a day or two, and then go mill off the final dimensions. And I'm, excuse me, I should re-say it. I dimension it like an eighth of an inch too big, and then redo it all taking off that last little bit in case there's any movement from the tension being released from all the removable material and that does happen on some species so if somebody's paying you thousands of dollars an extra day of waiting between steps isn't that big a deal you can do something else in between those stages so when i say i'm i'm going to do go to the next step and i'll be dimensioning a step it's basically Going and grabbing a 2x10, 2x12, and doing all these steps and all the thought processes for the part that I want to get. Whether I want to get quarter sawn, bastard sawn, or flat sawn material. So, hope you learned something. A lot of rambling. On to the next step.